Welcome to Brown Blasts, the Women's Leadership Council's podcast showcasing incredible women from all corners of the Brown University ecosystem. Today, we are delighted to feature Lois Lowry, award-winning author of more than 40 books, including The Giver, Number the Stars, and A Summer to Die. She attended Pembroke College, the Women's College at Brown, until 1971, in the 1950s, then left to get married. She completed her education at the University of Southern Maine and continues to write regularly with her dog, Alfie, by her side. Here, Ms. Lowry speaks with me, Katie Whalen, about her creative process, her advice for writers, the importance of noticing, and more. To start, how do you describe yourself and how do you describe your work? I would describe myself as an introvert and a multitasker and somebody who is really quite passionate about what I do, which is, I think, a good thing. Uh, and that segues into my work. How would I describe my work? You know, what I do is always the same thing, which is writing. But it is so varied because I work on so many different kinds of things. Uh, this morning, for example, I sat at my computer, as I do every day, working for several hours on a fairly lighthearted book for middle grade kids, which is what publishers call, what would it be, grades five through eight, I suppose. Uh, and yet some days I'm there working on something much more serious for older, older kids, teenagers, or occasionally for adults. Mostly my work is for young people. Uh, and now I'm going to zoom that back to how do I describe myself, because I am somebody who really loves kids. I, uh, I married young, not because I wanted to be married, but because I wanted to have kids. And uh, of course, I, my kids are all grown now, and I have grandchildren. I have grandchildren who are old enough to have kids themselves, although they've chosen not to so far. But that's who I am. I am somebody who loves kids, who loves to write, and who is introverted enough to be able to sit there doing it all by myself, day after day after day, uh, and, and who has a very happy life. Did you love being a kid? You know, when you're a kid, you don't think about, I am a kid now. Uh, but looking back, and I recently had a, a child ask me a question. I get email every day from kids. It used to be letters, now it's emails, of course. Uh, but asking uh, just a general question of what was your childhood like? And I replied that it was very happy and very ordinary, uh, which makes me assume that I did love being a kid. I don't remember yearning to be older. Uh, as a girl, a young girl, say 10, 11, I don't remember yearning to be a teenager as my sister was. And when I was a teenager, I didn't yearn to be an adult, but I did love every phase of my life during those periods when I was young. And in fact, I've, I've loved most of it ever since. I want to circle back to that, the questions that you get from readers, in particular kids. Mm -hmm. And is there any particular kind of question that um, you wish readers would ask you? You know, over the years, and, and let me think math now, my first book was published in 1977. So that is 42 years ago. Over those years, I have gotten so many questions that I can't think of any that I haven't been asked or any that I would love to be asked. I mean, all of us who have dogs would love to have somebody say, what kind of dog do you have? What's his name? But, you know, and, and kids actually do, do kind of uh, frequently ask that because that's the kind of thing kids are interested in. But no, I can't think of a single thing that I wish to be asked that I haven't been. I can say that I wish over the years I had given better answers to many mm -hmm. questions, but that's the kind of thing we all indulge in. Uh, what the French called Ponce d'Escalier, the thoughts you have on the stairs when you're leaving, the things you could have said. Um, but no, they've asked me everything and they continue to. And, and sometimes I become impatient because I've heard that question a thousand times, but I always remind myself that's the first time this kid has asked it. Yeah. Do you have a dog now? 
I do have a dog. And what's your dog's name? <laughs> My dog's name is Alfie because when I got him, I discovered from the breeder that his mother's name had been Georgie Girl. You're too young, perhaps, to put these two things together in your mind. But there were two British movies, Georgie Girl and Alfie, at the same time. They both had songs that became well-known songs. What's it all about, Alfie? Michael Caine. Uh, and so that's my dog's name. So this morning, when you're at your computer writing, where does Alfie factor into that? Alfie sleeps right at my feet. He has a bed there in, uh, in the room where I write. Incidentally, I'm sometimes asked for advice from people who want to be writers, and I always tell them to have a space. Virginia Woolf said it first, of course. Right. Right. But to have a sacrosanct space where that's what you do and, and, and nobody else invades that space. In my case, I have such a space, but Alfie is welcome to share it with me and he lies at my feet. Besides, Worshipfully. Well, yes, <laughs> of course. Is there anything besides Alfie um, worshipfully at your feet that um, you need to have in that sacrosanct space for, for writing? Uh, in the morning, a cup of coffee. Um, and that's about it. Uh, windows are nice and I have good windows, but I suppose if I didn't have a space with windows, I could make do with a windowless place. I could come in, commandeer a closet if I had to, and it would be my space. But I have a nice window window full place, lots of light, cup of coffee. In the old days, I would have said an ashtray, <laughs> which leads me now, this is stream of consciousness. Uh, in the old days, in the very old days, when I was a freshman at Brown, they gave out cigarettes in the dorm. I know, your mouth falls open. My doctor's mouth falls open. Little packs of five Winstons, and they got us all hooked on cigarettes. And the classrooms had probably still do, the desk with a, the arm that is also a table, and there was a little ashtray on each desk. And those rooms, those classrooms filled with smoke, and the professor would have been smoking. This is the 50s, the terrible 50s. But where did I go? Where did I get that from? Okay, I was I was talking about my space. No ashtray there now. No ashtray. Well, I am <laughs> delighted to hear that. I mean, it is interesting though, just thinking about our consciousness and education around smoking in the fifties. It was entirely different. I mean, I remember seeing um, you know, flipping through some very old magazines um, that in my that my family had, and there was a picture of a woman at her doctor's office. And they're yeah, both smoking. yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so that I think for me, part of the question is like, so what 50 years from now will we look back on and think, oh my goodness, like what, how could we possibly not have known that X is? Interesting question, which also leads me to this thought. Only once have I written a book that was set in the future. And although I didn't name the future time, I, I envisioned it as maybe 50 years from now. So I had to think about those things, what, what would be different. And I didn't go to extremes, I could have. Uh, but certainly there's no smoking in, in that book. Is there a reason there was just one book that was set in the future? You know, I, I said that, just one book set in the future, but I was wrong. I, I'm correcting myself right now because I later followed that book, which was The Giver, published in 1994, I think, several years later with a second one uh, called A Companion Book, not a sequel really, and then a third, and finally, just a few years ago, fourth. So it's now The Giver Quartet, and obviously they're all in the future. One of the things I always think about for anything that is not landed squarely in the present or the past as we have known it is the role of technology in the future. And one of the things that I appreciate about The Giver was, it was obviously it was written at a time when the sort of omnipresence of technology was a little bit less. It was written in 1992, yeah. I believe. And in fact, it was written on my first computer. It was the first of my books written on something other than an old typewriter. All of my books had been written up to that time on a typewriter. Not the typewriter I took with me to Brown. That was a manual typewriter that my father had given me on my 13th birthday. We're going way back now. Okay, I went to Brown when I was 17, took that typewriter with me, used it at Brown. Then much later, got an electric typewriter. That seemed an amazing change. 
and I wrote many books on that electric typewriter. And then in 1992, my daughter, who worked at MIT, she graduated from Vassar in 79. So she was, had been out in the work field for a while. And she said, Mom, you ought to be using a computer. I said, I don't know how. And she said, I will teach you. And she said, also, I can get you a discount. Uh, she said, I'll buy you a computer, you pay me back, and I'll teach you how to use it. And so she did. And she bought me something called a Deckmate 2 using her MIT discount. And even with that discount at that time, this would have been 1992, cost $4,000. Oh, yes, shocking. And it was huge. And the printer uh, had paper that was not, not individual pieces of paper. The paper came out attached to each other. You had oh, to separate yeah. all the yep. pages. Yep. Uh, and it was very, very noisy. And that's what I wrote The Giver on. And I only found out later, and then made the transition, that that was not actually a computer. That was a dedicated word processor. Uh, there was no internet involved. And the, the machine, my $4,000 machine, did not do anything except type manuscripts or letters or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it did nothing else. And so then probably only two or three years later, goodbye 4,000, I then got a, uh, I don't know what they were called in those days, but it was a Macintosh laptop. Mm -hmm. And that was my first real computer. Wow. Yeah. Did you, was there anything you missed about the typewriter at all when you transitioned over or did that transition happen? It would actually happen quite smoothly. And, and uh, I don't think there was anything I missed because it made things so much easier. And it also made my work better because prior to my word processor, if I wanted to change something, if I wanted to insert a paragraph, say, that meant I had to retype the whole damn manuscript. And I'm, you know, I didn't study typing at Brown. I wasn't an expert typist. Uh, and if I made a mistake, it was difficult to correct. And the word processor made that so easy that it then became difficult to know when to say the end. Because oh, there's always yeah. something you can make better. And so I would get to the end of the book, say the giver, the first one I wrote on that machine, type the end. And then think, well, now wait a minute and go back. And, and it was just so easy to go back and fix things, change things, take things out. And this has been true of every book since. I just have to tell myself, okay, you know, this is it. You can't keep doing this. Uh, enough revision. And yet in my earlier books written on a typewriter, I didn't revise enough mm. because of the difficulty. Also, copies. Okay, I mean, now I can spit out copies easily. In those early days, I would take that manuscript from the computer and uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I suppose I would take it someplace to be Xeroxed, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But then I would give a copy to the publisher and then I would have the only copy in my possession. I would store it in the, in the vegetable drawer of the refrigerator. So that if my house burned down, that manuscript was very valuable. And before it went to the publisher, it was the only copy. And you, you know, we all know the story of Hemingway's wife leaving his manuscript on a train. Uh, and that was the only copy he had, that lost book. So I feared that. Now I don't. Now I, I have so many copies or could make so many copies. It's very different. So loosely related to that but you know you've been writing for you said 42 years now well i was that? writing before that for oh. magazines but my first book was published 42 years ago so now um it's safe to say you, you have a little experience writing mm -hmm. um do you get nervous when you submit a draft to an editor or to the publisher oh i don't think nervous is the word uh, I had the same editor for many, many books and many, many years. And uh, he retired, oh gosh, I've forgotten how long ago. It's, it's perhaps 10 years ago. 
And so then I acquired a new editor and she's the only one I've had since then. This is aside from a few things I did on the side, but basically I've had the same publisher and only two editors. Um, my first editor, a man, and that's unusual in the children's book world. Mm. Most editors in, in that field seem to be women for some reason. But at any rate, he, he pretty much liked everything I, I wrote. And um, so, so uh, until, until my, and actually one book, just as he was retiring, I gave it to him and he didn't like it. And that, that was quite shocking to me because I was accustomed to being accepted so easily. And so I told him I wanted to get a second opinion. He looked shocked. And uh, finally, he said, oh, well, okay, and, uh, but who would you get it from? And I suggested an editor at another publishing company whom I knew he respected. And he said, okay, well, let's see what she says. And so I sent it to her and I said, you know, this is, I, I explained all the circumstances. And uh, she wrote back after she read it and she said, if he doesn't want it, I'll publish it. And so that made him change his mind. And he said, well, okay, I'll publish it. But then he retired before it was published. So it acquired a new editor who liked it. And it, it's important for the editor to like the book. Uh, I've, I've never, I sp there may have been times in the past when an editor didn't like something of mine they were working on, but they never let me know. it. Hmm. Now I've forgotten what your question was. Oh, do I get nervous? Uh, I don't think so. There have been uh, a couple of books that I've written that uh, my current editor has not liked. Mm -hmm. And so I've set them aside and maybe in the future I'll, or maybe she just felt that they needed two more changes than I felt willing to make. Mm -hmm. The time may come, although who knows, cause I'm going to be 82 this week. I don't have that much time left, but, um, the time may come when I'll feel ready to make extensive changes mm -hmm. on one or both of those manuscripts. In the meantime, they're set aside. And uh, I'm working on a new one and, and, you know, maybe she won't like it. There's no guarantee. I, I don't sign a contract until the book is finished. Mm -hmm. So there's no uh, deadline, which some people feel the need of a deadline. Uh, I don't, I, that would feel pressure to me. Uh, but there's no guarantee, and I just work on it till it's done, and then I show it uh, to my agent and to my editor. Is there anything that you hope from them, that you hope that they will be able to see that maybe you can't see in the writing process, or that you know that they will catch that you might not catch in the writing process? What I always hope is that there won't be anything wrong at all <laughs> that needs any revision. <laughs> Uh, the, the truth is, there's always something that I'm grateful that they point out mm -hmm. because you do lose your, your uh, objectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're so immersed uh, with, with a piece of writing, you're sitting there with it for some months. And, and so you, you, uh, you really miss the flaws and you need somebody. Uh, but if you're wise, you don't give it to your best friend or your husband or your neighbor to point out things because... Uh, it really needs a professional, mm -hmm. uh, and they're the ones who who can see that and 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 can also help you figure out how to fix it. Mm -hmm. Was that hard earned insight for you of not giving it to a best friend or husband or neighbor? I I never have done that, mm -hmm. uh, and nor has a best friend, husband, or neighbor ever asked me to. So I'm mm -hmm. fortunate that way. No. How do you reconcile the tension, and if, if there is one for you, between the isolation needed for that work, that time at the computer, and loneliness? Do those come up at all in a, to a head at all for you? Well, uh, I wouldn't call it isolation. You certainly do need to be alone to sit in a room and write a book. But isolation makes it sound as though you're there because you have TB or something and you don't want somebody to catch. And it has a negative con connotation to me. Uh, I prefer the word solitude, mm -hmm. and uh, solitude is something I, I value and love. And it is not a lonely kind of situation to be in a situation of solitude, for a writer at least, because your world within that solitude is so heavily populated. I mean, I live with an ongoing cast of characters 
granted, I manipulate them to be what I want them to be since I'm going to be living with them for a while. But they keep me interested. They keep me amused. They make me sad. They make me laugh. And, and when you're in that kind of situation, you don't get lonely. At the end of the day or the end of whatever time you've set for yourself, you turn your computer off or put it to sleep and go in the other room. And then you'd like to have people around to talk to, not about what you've been working on. Mm. I, I had to say, I don't have a husband, but I have a spouse equivalent. <laughs> so for lack of a better term, I said to him just recently, I don't like to talk about what I'm working on because he had asked me, when I closed up one afternoon and he said, you know, what, how far did you get? What are you, where are you in the manuscript? And, and I began to tell him and then I thought, uh, it doesn't feel right to tell him. So I had to say, I don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It goes away if I talk about it. It goes away uh, as the words go into the atmosphere, the ideas go with it. And so I need mm -hmm. to keep that all to myself while I'm working on it. How do you handle it when you have a character who you either really like and don't want to let go or don't want to see anything bad happen to them in that book or who you either really don't like and um, have not enjoyed spending time with them? A long time ago, 1980, it was published, which means that I wrote it in 1979. So it is a very long time ago. I wrote a book called Autumn Street, which was autobiographical. It was fiction. I wrote it as fiction, but it really was plucked from my own life when I was a small child in Pennsylvania during World War II. And uh, during that time, I had a friend who was murdered. And uh, that happens in the book. I changed the friend from a girl. Her real name was Gloria. Uh, so he's a little boy in the book named Charles. And when I got to the part in the book where Charles was going to be killed, it was very, very hard for me to write that. Mm -hmm. If he had been a totally fictional child, maybe it would have been different. I'm not sure. I've certainly done many books in which people have died or, or disappeared in some fashion, but that was the one that came to my mind when you asked the question. That was hard. At this, and also, my very first book was fictionalized autobiography. It was about the death of my older sister when we were both young. Mm -hmm. The two girls in the book are 13 and 15, told from the point of view of the 13-year-old girl about the effect on the whole family of the death of her 15-year-old sister. Kids often ask this question. Girls, girls read that book. Boys don't. Mm -hmm. Girls refer to it as a feelings book. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Oh. And, and boys tend to veer away from books that can be described that way. Girls have asked whether it was difficult for me to write that book, which dealt with my sister's death. And in thinking about it, I think it was not. When my sister died, I was a young wife, as was she. We were not 13 and 15. We were in our early 20s. And I began to tell the story of the two sisters when they were young to my own little girl, who was four at the time. And she was bored with it after a while and wiggled off my lap and went away. And I didn't have anybody to tell it to. And so I think I told that story in my own mind to my own self again and again over the years and didn't have any place to put it until a publisher asked me to write a book for young people. And that's the story that came to my mind. And writing it down, well, there is a line in Shakespeare in Macbeth and I've forgotten who says the line, but he says it to Macduff, whose wife and children have been killed. And he says to Macduff, give sorrow words. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I did when I wrote that first book, which was called A Summer to Die. I gave words to the grief I had felt. And perhaps I was doing it again a few years later when I wrote Autumn Street. Those, though, were both based on real people. Fictional people whom I create and then kill off, I don't have that kind of commitment to, mm -hmm. I think. You know, I think I always know that they're made up characters and mm -hmm. I could bring them back if I wanted <laughs> to. <laughs> well, I wanted to circle back just briefly to something you said about sort of feelings books. And for me growing up, you know, I had some male friends when I was much younger who 
literature provided such a safe space for them to have feelings and to be human beings who are allowed to feel a wide variety of things in a way that sometimes society did not afford them mm-hmm. as young boys. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, you know, I, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to, to say that I would imagine that some of your books have certainly done that for... Well, I, I, I would hope so. And of course, I was overgeneralizing when I said that. And something has now just popped into my mind and memory. And it's my own son, Ben. He was born in 1961. He's 58 years old, I guess. And he would have been about seven or eight when this happened. So he would have been, say, second grade. When he walked into the kitchen... I was always in the kitchen in those days. Ben was the youngest of four children. I was Mm -hmm. a busy housewife and mother. Walked into the kitchen after school, kind of looking morose. And I said, Ben, what's wrong? And he said, I just read the saddest sentence I've ever read. And I've forgotten the page number. He told me page whatever of Charlotte's Web. And the sentence was, no one was with her when she died. And for an author, E.B. White, as it happened, to be able to convey to an eight-year-old child the tragedy of that sentence was really remarkable. And not too long after that, Ben would be chuckling if he were sitting here listening to me describe this, but Ben had a pet rabbit named Barney, Barney Bunny. And one day he let Barney out to play on the lawn and a German shepherd from the neighborhood ran over and grabbed Barney. And Ben came in the kitchen carrying his rabbit who was still alive, but clearly dying. And I told him that Barney probably wasn't going to live and he walked off to his bedroom carrying his dying rabbit. And I peeked in a little later and he was lying on the bed beside Barney. Covers over Barney with his ears nicely flattened out on the pillow. And he lay there while Barney died. And he didn't make this connection, nor did I say it to him. But I was aware that he was reacting still in his own way, as we all do to things we've read, to that sentence that no one was with her when she died, and that it was important to be with him, with his Barney bunny when he died. Um, so I shouldn't laugh and it's a very sweet scene I'm laughing because my mind has leapt ahead we buried Barney of course with ceremony Mm -hmm. in the backyard with a little cross made of popsicle sticks and a plaque that said here lies Barney Bunny lover of carrots and beloved friend of Benjamin Lowry not terribly long after that I noticed that there was another grave nearby new with a new little popsicle stick cross. And I asked the kids, and, and another of my children confessed, my daughter Kristen. She said she had been starting to eat a hard boiled egg, <laughs> and it looked like it had been trying to be a chicken. Oh. And so she had had a little funeral for it. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at that, it's very sweet. <laughs> oh, wow. At any rate, uh, all of that has to do with the effects that literature can have upon the psyche of, of children and, and a role that it can play, and, and an important role. And it's one of the reasons that I feel profoundly the importance of what I do, uh, that I don't take it lightly, that I don't whip these books off, even with if a book is, as the one I'm currently working on, a lighthearted book. Uh, I am not doing it lightheartedly. Mm. Uh, on one level, I'm aware always that, that this will affect children. Mm. Well, it makes me wonder sort of what are the creative projects that you find yourself saying yes to? And then sort of the flip side of that would be what are the creative projects you find yourself saying no to? Most often, I choose my own project. The books that I do are books that I think of and write. Uh, and no publisher says to me, would you do a book about? If they would, if they did, I probably would say no, because it would be their idea and not mine. However, um, I'm aware as I say this, that the one I'm currently working on was suggested by my agent and editor simply because there's a movie coming out next year made from a book that I wrote called The Willoughbys. And they suggested that it would be fun to have simultaneously or 
shortly thereafter with the movie to have a sequel come out to The Willoughby. So, so I'm, I'm working on that now. Uh, but by and large, I choose uh, my projects. And sometimes, uh, though, people come to me. I'm, I'm trying to remember his name. An editor came to me with uh, asking me to contribute uh, a piece to a, a collection. And the name of the book is The Good Book. And it's various authors writing about something from the Bible, which has affected them. I am not a religious person. But the instant he emailed me, I've never met him, uh, and asked me that, something came to my mind. And so I did write a piece uh, for that collection. More recently, Andre Dubus, the author, has asked me to do something for a collection that he's putting together. Oh, and I... Here's a, a very interesting project that I did recently, and this is for adults. And, and I, I tend to gravitate or to view more kindly requests that I do something for adults because it's different from what I ordinarily do. There's an artist in Maine, and if I think long enough, I'll come up with his name. Uh, but at any rate, he did a series of paintings. I've forgotten how many, perhaps 14. The paintings are very large. They were exhibited in a New York gallery and then again in the uh, Institute of Contemporary Art in Rockland, Maine. Uh, these large paintings, each one is uh, set at night. You assume they're all Maine. They look like Maine, though they could be Vermont, New Hampshire. They're New England paintings. They're, they're at night. They're very provocative and evocative. And then he asked if there are 14, he asked 14 authors. If there are 16, then 16 authors. I've forgotten the number to write a short story based on the painting. Richard Russo here in Portland mm -hmm. uh, did one. Andre Dubus did one. When they asked me, I, I was delighted to be able to do it because it's so seldom I have that opportunity to do it on an adult project. And uh, I sat a long time, weeks, looking at that painting and came up with a story. Uh, then the book was published, beautifully printed with the paintings. Uh, and uh, the stories. And the title of the book is Night Stories, and it's a remarkable book. So I was, I was uh, thrilled to be able to be part of that project. Other things I, I, I say no to. Once, many years ago, I was asked to uh, write a children's book based on, uh, it was some Bible story, Moses or something in the bulrushes. Yeah. And I said, nah, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think that's already been written. <laughs> it's, it's in the Bible. It's been done. Uh, but I have so many ideas of my own that I don't really need suggestions from other people, though I'm happy to think about them. Mm. So where in your writing life were you when you were at Brown? I had uh, gone to high school in New York City, private school, all girls. Now, of course, it's co-ed. Now, of course, it's much more expensive than it was when I went there. But at any rate, there were only about 30 girls in my graduating class. And I had been greatly encouraged by my English teachers to uh, pursue writing. I, I'm sorry I lost it, although I don't know what I would do with it if I still had it. But I remember a paper that was returned to me, which my English teacher had uh, written on it. Be sure to go on writing. I think there's a chance you may do something with it. <laughs> but anyway, any rate, um, I went from there to Brown with high recommendations from teachers of writing. Uh, I went there to major in writing. In those days, the curriculum was very different mm. from what it is now. But I don't know how I wangled my way into this, but I got to take some upper level writing courses right away. I did, of course, have to fulfill a requirement. I don't think Brown has these requirements anymore. I, I, I tested out of some things, mm -hmm. but, but I had to take, the, you know, I had to take a political science course and a math course, so I dreaded the math course. Uh, but I did get into these, these seminars, these writing seminars, which, which uh, I so loved. And those professors, the one I remember most was uh, Charles Philbrick, mm -hmm. who has died, but they also encouraged me. However, this was the 50s. So we all sat around in our writing seminar. The air was thick with smoke from our cigarettes. But also in the 50s, many girls, and I was one, and we called ourselves girls then, not women. 
left and got married. And so I dropped out at the end of my sophomore year because my boyfriend was two years older. He was graduating. So I just quit and got married. Mm -hmm. And uh, all my aspirations sort of were put on hold. My creativity turned toward motherhood, I guess. I had four children before I was 26. And then I waited until the youngest one went to kindergarten and I went back to college. It took me four years to complete the two that I still owed to get a bachelor's degree. And then I went on for work on a master's degree. But in the meantime, I started writing professionally. I was living in Maine then. And uh, I was doing freelance writing for magazines. I also, in graduate school, studied photography, something that had always interested me. And it made me um, more of a marketable commodity as a freelance writer, because I could do the photography for magazine articles as well. The man on the cover of the book, The Giver, is a man that I photographed for a magazine article. And I had, I had my own dark room, and I used to keep copies of some photographs. Not all, but that man's face had haunted me. I'd kept him. And then the little girl, blonde girl on the cover of a book called Number of the Stars mm -hmm. was a girl I had been hired to photograph and I kept a copy of her photograph. When I wrote Number of the Stars, which would have been 1988 probably, I gave a copy of that photograph to the book editor because they had asked, they were gonna hire an artist for the cover and they'd asked what the girl should look like. And here was this, a child happened to be Swedish. Here was a Scandinavian 10-year-old girl. And so they said, can we use the photograph? And I tracked down her parents to ask, and they laughed, and they said, you'll have to call her. She's all grown up. Mm -hmm. And in fact, she has children in college now. So I was taking a lot of English courses at Brown and some writing courses. Uh, the literature courses, I think, are the ones that were the more valuable, actually. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, uh, Brown was certainly encouraging to me. I will say, however, and this was typical of the 50s, nobody, when I announced that I was leaving school and getting married, nobody suggested that that was not a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I was 18 years old when I made that decision. Mm -hmm. My parents didn't say, hey, why don't you stay and get your degree? None of my professors, not the dean at Pembroke, which it was then, mm -hmm. nobody. Uh, it was considered, I think, uh, a thing that, that we girls did. You know, we found a husband and it took some of us longer than others, and, and so off we went. I, I, I'm sad about that now. However, if I had stayed in school and graduated, I would have just turned 21. Uh, I wouldn't have been ready to write professionally. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would have gone on to graduate school. More likely, I would have taken a very low-level job in publishing somewhere mm -hmm. and, and then found a husband <laughs> and quit that. So I don't know. There's no easy answer. I did love Brown, and I loved my courses there. But when I went back to school, which was in Maine, because that's where I lived at the time, uh, and I was in my 30s, I loved every course uh, then. I didn't have to think about who I was going to have a date with on the weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to have a date with my husband and kids. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it was very different. I was able to, to truly devote myself, <laughs> with the exception of cooking dinner and doing the laundry, uh, to my courses. And, and that was a very uh, happy, happy time for me those years when I was in my 30s and doing my homework on the kitchen table with my kids. Well, I want to be respectful of, of your time, which you've been really generous with, but is there any question that I haven't asked that... You no, like you started ask? right off asking about my dog. That was just <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah. No, I can't think of anything. I mean, I'm happy to talk on and on uh, until my parking meter expires, but uh, <laughs> I don't know what kinds of things people would be interested in. Well, I think one of the things that I'm really struck by is how much you notice. Um, just, you know, the, the story about the popsicle stick cross over Barney the rabbit. Uh -huh. and, um, and I think one of the things that I certainly struggle with in this very fast and very preoccupied world is better noticing the world around me, which I think would, is essential for any creative process. Oh, that's, that's, that's such a great 
question, or maybe it's not even really a question. It's a it's a commentary, and it's so true. And and I'm guilty of it as well of not often enough looking up from my electronics. I criticize my grandchildren for that, but I, I do it myself as well. And yet, Henry James was the one who famously once said that a writer is someone on whom nothing is lost. Mm -hmm. And one hopes for that to be true, and yet we do lose so much in our daily lives with, with all the stuff going on. The, the world has become speedier, I think. There's too much happening all the time and too much to pay attention to. I think it's important to slow down, to look up, breathe in. I'm going to start sounding like a yoga instructor. <laughs> but, but you're right, noticing is, is, is key. And uh, I still, I think it was partly being a photographer. And I think I also am very photographic in my writing. I, I, I pay a lot of attention to composition, where things are, where they go, how they fit together visually as well as, as uh, literally. And I am somebody who does see things, I think, uh, with, I, w I won't say greater clarity than everybody else, but certainly with, with uh, great interest in, in some clarity, I think. Is there anything that you're looking for when you're seeing? Is there anything you're hoping to see? Yes, connections between things, mm -hmm. I think. What can I use as an example for that? But uh, I was surprised when I got into town to meet you today. The big parking lot beyond the uh, auditorium was mm. full. What's mm. going on? Something's happening in town. So I was driving around looking for a parking place and eventually found one. In the course of walking here from that parking place, I, I passed a homeless guy. I assume a homeless guy. A guy dressed like and walking like and looking like and acting like a homeless guy. And, you know, it's easy to walk past someone and, and observe that and forget it. But I, I tend to see him and, and begin to wonder what his connections are to me, to the world, to the people around him. And even as I say that, here's a question you should ask me. Mm. I'll ask it of myself. Mm. Because the question is, what, what, have I, what is next to be published by me? And mm. it's a book about that. It's about mm. our connections, our human connections, one to another. And I'll just tell you the starting point for that book. It, it is not fiction, it's, it's autobiographical. I was born in Honolulu and I was always, as a child, in the days before television, it was always very exciting when Daddy would get out the home movies and show them. I mean, that was our visual entertainment. He would set up a screen, set up the big projector, and Mother would lower the shades, and we'd watch once again. We'd watch Baby Lois on the beach in Waikiki, and there's Daddy on a horse, and there's Mother pouring milk, and Daddy would run the projector backwards, and the milk would fly back into the picture. You know, it was... Uh, I had watched those films many, many times, and then time passed. We moved out of the country, put things in storage. Television arrived. By then, we were in New York. The McCarthy hearings were on, so my parents bought a television, and we never looked at those films again. And then I was visiting my parents when they were very old, and Dad showed me those old films in metal canisters in the garage. And he opened up the metal cans, and the film smelled terrible. It was beginning to deteriorate. So I brought it back to Boston with me. I found somebody who would transfer it to videotape. This was the early days of videotape. And I had just bought a, what did you call it, a VCR? Is that what you, yeah. And so I had Daddy's home movies what they could save on this videotape. And I had company in the living room and I made them look at my old home movies before I sent them to my father. And there is the picture, which I'd seen a zillion times before. There I am with the little shovel in my hand on the beach. There's nobody else on the beach except my grandmother who was visiting and she's watching me. And it's an idyllic scene. It's Waikiki, the color had faded. The original film had been colored. And so we, that, that scene passed, and the next one is my sister and me with a watering can, watering flowers in Mother's Garden in Honolulu. But there was someone in my living room who was a lawyer in Boston, but he had been, that was a second career, he had been captain of a nuclear submarine. 
And he said, wait a minute, go back to the scene on the beach. So we figured out how to pause, rewind, start up again. We watched baby Lois on the beach again. And he said, look on the horizon. And that's the title of my new book. And on the horizon, shrouded in mist, but moving slowly across is a ship. And John, who had been captain of a submarine, said, that's the Arizona. So suddenly, all of us were kind of dumbstruck because there's me, happy, my grandmother smiling as she watches me. And on that ship are 1,200 young men who are going to be dead within months. And so I've thought about that ever since. I've been haunted by it. What is my connection to them? And that's what this new book is about. Be published in 2020, and the title is On the Horizon. Well, 2020 can't come soon enough. <laughs> it makes me think about that. Is it the end of Howard's End? Is it the line is connect, only connect? Only connect, only connect. That's also the book where the bookcase falls on, on somebody and kills him. Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Death by book. Death by book. <laughs> <laughs> Only connect. You're right. That was Forster who said that. Yeah. Only connect the, the prose and the passion. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's. I mean, I, what I think is so interesting about the time that we're in right now is there does seem to be multi generational epidemic of loneliness, um, and that uh, we have the guise of connection with so much mm -hmm. more technology. And yet I love well, it's all it's fake news. I hate to well, use the well, phrase. But yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not, superficial. Yeah, yeah, it's not that I could send off 79 emails and not feel any closer to anybody around no. me or to the, even to the people that I've emailed. No, and I think no. that, but I also think what I love about the kind of connection you're talking about is, you know, what is, what is our connection to, mm -hmm. or what is, you know, the young Lois's connection to those men on that ship? And what is our connection to people who we might never actually meet or see, and yet somehow we have shared this earth together at some point, and mm -hmm. do we have a responsibility to them? Do we owe them, or are we... Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what, what, uh, what this book tries to address. And of course, it's a question that isn't answerable, but it's yeah. wonderful to to uh, think about it and to be aware of, of it. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I will, I'll just wrap up with this, which is, um, so when I was uh, in sixth grade, we read The Giver, and that was written by um, a person who I never thought that I would meet. <laughs> and if I hadn't met you, you would not have known that you changed my life. Uh, you opened my life up in a way that I did not know my life could be opened up. And so now I feel that um, I have this opportunity to connect with you. I would like to say thank you so much. I am a better and a bigger person for the work that you have done in the world. Oh, thank you. I think that's the most that any writer hopes for, that they affect individuals uh, in, a, in a very personal way. And it's, it's very gratifying when somebody lets you know that that has happened to them. It works both ways, of course. 